my computer gets set up, I think we'll go ahead and get started. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, um, in person and on Zoom. Thank you for coming today. Uh, really appreciate it. I think you all know me by now. I'm Cindy. Um, I'm one of the co-leaders uh, for this session. So uh, we have a really great lecture today. I'm really excited about this one. Um, so um, I will introduce Maria in just a little bit. But as you guys know, we have a few uh, things we have to get through. Um, our, we have to do our Saturday morning civics tradition. So everybody on Zoom, get ready. Everybody in person, get ready. And you all know what to do. Let's all stand up. So heart, so minds. Um, we are Maria is like, what's going on? This is a Saturday morning civics tradition for us. So we all get up and do some stretches um, so that we're all ready to learn. So just a moment. Yes, we'll all do them together. So uh, let's just like, I'm going to add something today, ad lib. We're going to reach toward the sky, get all stretched out, get all the kinks worked out. Let's reach towards the earth. Just shake it all out. So three breaths. First one, nice deep breath. Get ready. One, two, three. Breathe in. Breathe out. Let all that out. Ready to learn. Breathe in. Breathe out. That was a good one. One more time. Breathe in. Breathe out. All right. You can all sit down, get comfortable, get ready to learn. Awesome. Thanks for doing it with us, Maria. So um, this week, we have a really exciting talk about neutrinos. Neutrinos are such a big part of what we do at Fermilab um, and part of what makes Fermilab physics really world-leading. So this is a really excited about this talk. I'm um, going to introduce our speaker. So our speaker today is Maria Martinez Gonzalez. Um, she is a postdoc uh, here at Fermilab. So she joined us recently in our neutrino division. She works on two large collaborations hosted at Fermilab, uh, an experiment called NOVA, which stands for NUMI, Off-Axis Electron Neutrino Appearance Experiment, and the upcoming DUNE, Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. In addition, she is working on building a brand new experiment called MAMBA, which is a bubble chamber. Maria got her PhD at Iowa State University um, she did most of her work as a visitor at Fermilab, so she's very familiar with the place. And she obtained her bachelor's degree in engineering physics from Tecnológico de Monterrey in Mexico. Maria's current work and interests focus on neutrino interactions in order to better understand neutrino oscillations. And when she's not at the lab, she enjoys dancing, especially ballet. So let's give a big welcome to our speaker, Maria. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here early on a Saturday morning. Is the mic does it sound okay for folks on Zoom as well? Let's get a confirmation. Um, does the audio sound okay on Zoom? Yes, uh, it sounds okay. Thank okay. you so much. Great. Okay. Uh, well, just as Cindy said, I just want to introduce myself very briefly. I am from Mexico, and um, the first time I heard about neutrinos is when I was in college. And I was uh, very fortunate to have the opportunity to come here to Fermilab um, to do an internship working with neutrino experiments. And since then, I've been uh, following neutrinos. Very exciting. But anyways, I think you've heard about the standard model in your lecture last week. So you know that um, the standard model is composed of the quarks, the leptons, the, and the, bos the bosons. Um, 
your everyday elementary particles are the up and down quarks, photons, and electrons, which make up pretty much everything we see around us. And uh, the standard model is very successful at explaining most of the phenomena we see around us. Um, and today we're focusing on this side of the standard model. We have three uh, types of neutrinos, which uh, we call the three neutrino flavors, and they interact only via the weak force, so through the W and Z bosons. And why are neutrinos so interesting to us? Uh, well, one of their characteristics, characteristics is that they pass through almost everything. They're pretty much everywhere, but they rarely interact. This is why I call my talk the ghostly neutrinos. And one other characteristic, as uh, I really like this cartoon, is that uh, neutrinos have mass, um, but the standard model that you learned about last week predicts them to have no mass. So that's one thing. And so far, we know that their masses are pretty small, but you see this is the fuzzy line. We don't know for sure what's the exact value of the mass. Uh, but we know it's pretty small. So if you can see this logarithmic scale, uh, 10 to the minus 9, so they are pretty much billions of times smaller, lighter than um, some of these heavier quarks. That's quite a big difference. And where do neutrinos come from? Well, there are multiple sources. I said pretty much everywhere. Neutrinos from the sun, neutrinos from the Earth's core, um, neutrinos from radioactive decays. So any atom that has um, unstable um, uh, status, some, some of these decay. And bananas have potassium, so then a banana has neutrinos. Um, Particle accelerators, like the ones here at Fermilab, uh, and from the Big Bang. So you can see pretty much everywhere. Um, but it's OK. Don't worry. The neutrino is not probably in your lifetime. Maybe just one neutrino will interact with you, but don't even notice. Um, but yeah, 65 billion of neutrinos are passing through your fingernail every second. So. That's a lot of neutrinos. Uh, but so we know some of these characteristics, but how do we even know about them? So what are neutrinos? How do we know their behavior? How do we detect them? Why are they interesting to study? How do we know that there are three or is there even more? Well, uh, before trying to answer some of these questions, uh, I'll start with a historical tour. I really like the history of neutrinos. It's a um, um, very illustrative way of how science works. So let's start. Um, so we can head back to the early 20th century, so about uh, 1900. Uh, and at this time, uh, the scientists had already discovered what is uh, what are radioactive decays. So there are three types of radioactive decays, which means that when an atom is unstable, it loses energy and it emits uh, different types of radiation. So we have alpha decays, which means that the atom emits uh, alpha particle, which is two protons, two neutrons. And there's the beta decay, which uh, people used to call um, beta particle the emission of this decay, but it's actually an electron. And then there's gamma decays, which emit uh, radiation like X-rays, um, electromagnetic uh, radiation. And uh, this was a pretty uh, big discovery. And these uh, three amazing scientists, uh, Pierre and Marie Curie and Henry Becquerel, uh, studied a lot of these uh, a radioactive decays, discovery of spontaneous radioactivity, their joint research with Becquerel. So this very important discovery earned them a Nobel Prize. So let's focus on the beta decay because this is where, where uh, the story begins. So this is an example 
where you start with an atom of bismuth, uh, which they used to call back in the day radium E. And so the decay uh, emits the beta particle, and then your bismuth atom becomes polonium, just two different elements. Uh, if we look a little bit more into the detail, uh, as I mentioned before, when an atom decays, it liberates energy. So if you look at uh, the difference in mass of the two elements that you have here, um, it is 1.16 mega electron volts, which is a unit of energy. And then um, if you actually add up so that means that this energy that was released should be carried away by the electron. So this energy def would define what is the momentum of the electron. And by energy and momentum conservation, the total energy here should be the total energy here, right? And since this is always has the same mass and this will supposed to have always the same momentum, then expect to see something like this. Feel free to jump in with questions anytime. Um, so, so if you were to graph your observations, you would expect to see that all of your electrons have the same energy. But this is what they actually saw. So the place uh, of 1.16 mega electron volts, which is approximately here, was not what they expected. So this is a continuous distribution. And what it is telling you is that, um, well, your electrons have different energies. So that energy must be going somewhere or energy was not conserved. And this, this was a pretty big deal because um, uh, conservation of energy was a principle that was known uh, centuries ago and that someone comes with an experiment and says, hey, I think energy is not conserved. It's a pretty big deal. So something was wrong here. And this is where, where our story starts taking leading towards neutrinos. So in 1930, uh, Wolfgang Pauli proposed a solution to rescue the conservation of energy in the beta decay. So uh, what he proposed is that instead of decaying only into a different uh, atom and an electron, there is an additional particle that takes away the rest of the energy that they were not observing. And uh, it's supposed to be a light, neutral, and weakly interacting particle. And he called it the neutron. Um, and this is a letter that he sent to a conference proposing this, uh, this particle. Um, so everyone was very uncomfortable with um, this problem. So as you can see, this very, some very dramatic lines of this, uh, of this letter. I have hit upon a desperate remedy to save the conservation of energy. It may seem almost improbable because one would probably have seen those neutrons if they exist a long time ago. Um, but anyways, he did not go to this conference because he had a party to go. So. Okay, a uh, couple of years later, uh, James Chadwick, uh, discover the neutron, the, what we actually call a neutron now, uh, but it's a different particle. Um, so then comes uh, Enrico Fermi. Um, so a couple of years later, he proposed to rename this uh, invented particle, the neutrino, which means little neutral one, so smaller than the neutron. So he also not only changed the name of the neutrino, but proposed uh, a theory which explains the beta decay. And uh, we know it as Fermi's golden rule. And uh, it basically uh, explains the interaction that produces this decay where a neutron 
uh, converts into a proton and emits an electron and a neutrino. And uh, the proposition was that this doesn't have mass, this doesn't have charge, just a tiny little thing that um, saves everything. Uh, nowadays, we know that in the beta decay, this is actually an antineutrino. And Fermi's theory also predicted the decay of the muon uh, into neutrino, antineutrino, and uh, electron. And uh, this very early proposal, uh, it is still valid. It, it would later be extended to what we know now as the weak interaction and in the standard model. Um, so, so if you have a neutrino in place, now the beta decay can conserve energy. So if your electron has almost zero energy, it means that the neutrino took most of those 1.16 electron volts. Or if you're here, the neutrino has fewer energy and the electron takes most of that. So the energy release is now shared between the two particles. And in theory, everything's good. Now just the um, experimentalist has the job to find this particle. So now, after this theoretical proposal, see how, how scientists found the neutrino. So I'm just gonna uh, do a brief introduction of a uh, scattering experiment. So what scattering experiment measure is the cross-section of a particle interaction. And uh, a cross-section uh, is measured in uh, units of area, but it, uh, it refers to the number of times in which a particle interacts with something. For instance, this is an older experiment where uh, some alpha particles radiation was emitted and it collided with a uh, gold foil. And then there is this uh, screen where you could count how many, um, how many times you saw an interaction. So you can see this is an area and you can calculate interactions per area. That's a cross section. So um, you can see one year later, after uh, Fermi proposed uh, his uh, theory, they calculated the cross-section for neutrinos with about 2 MeV of energy, which is just slightly larger than um, the decay of the um, and you see, then they calculated a cross-section smaller than this number, which is very, very small. Uh, this translates to a penetrating power of 10 to the 16 kilometer in solid matter. So what does this actually mean? What it means is that the mean free path in water is this many centimeters, which is uh, 1,600 light years. So the, the mean free path means the distance that a particle can travel without colliding with anything. So, you know, it's even many, many more times the diameter of the Earth. So that's a problem. Um, this is an excerpt of that uh, paper where they made this calculation. And this is what they say, absolutely impossible to observe this process with neutrinos from nuclear interactions. Uh, so basically, neutrinos from beta decays. So they concluded there is no practical way that we will ever see the neutrino. And hopefully, uh, he was not happy. It was something that is not detectable. Yeah, if you're a scientist and you propose something that cannot be proved, is that really a useful theory? Probably not. But uh, experimentalists are very stubborn people. So they do a lot of uh, experiments to try to find theories that make sense. Is there a question? There is a quick clarifying question from Zoom. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, on the slide with mean free path, they wanted to know what the N um, referred to. I'm not sure where the N is. Uh, this N, 
Oh, yes, there it is. So um, they, they wondered what that in term referred to. Yeah, um, this N refers to, I think, the density of matter. Yeah, because uh, it, I think it, it changes uh, the, and depends. Well, the mean prepad depends on the type of matter that you are uh, making this calculation with. I'll, I'll double check and I'll uh, in the end. But yeah, I think it's density of matter. Okay, any more questions? So, uh, if the neutrino had this very long in, um, mean free pass, um, there are two things that you can do um, to try and increase the probability that a neutrino will interact with matter. So that is either you get a lot of neutrinos or you get a large mass, very large detector for the neutrinos to interact with. Um, let me take a little bit of a detour here before we go to the neutrino discovery. Um, so this is uh, what we call now a Feynman diagram of the beta decay. So um, as you can see, the W boson emits, uh, is emitted uh, so that the neutron transforms to a proton. And here's your electron and antineutrino. Uh, the physicist uh, Yukawa proposed this W boson as a carrier of the weak force, which is uh, one step further from what uh, Fermi had proposed uh, a few years earlier. And this is, of course, one of the fundamental forces uh, that are in the standard model. And it is uh, about 10,000 10, times weaker than the electromagnetic force, which uh, makes sense, considering that um, that calculation told us that the neutrino is probably never, well, not never, probably very unlikely that we see an interaction. And uh, the standard model has uh, uh, symmetries. It's constructed on symmetries. You probably heard about this on the, the other lecture. And I want to highlight this property about the symmetries that any interaction that occurs forward in time can also occur backwards. So if you have a reaction like this, A plus B is C plus D, um, you can uh, swap uh, the initial and the final uh, particles in this reaction, but to do pass them to the other side, they become their antiparticles. So here are a few combinations of what can happen. Um, and this is a typo, this should be C plus B. Um, sorry about that. So if you have your beta decay and time goes that way, you can basically take this antineutrino, keep that leg of your Feynman diagram, and it becomes an anti the other type. Um, sorry, this is a different reaction because here you had a neutron and a proton. So basically what we did is flip the electron, so it becomes an anti-electron here or positron but then this diagram is flipped again. Does that make sense? So this is what we call inverse beta decay. Um, and this is a way where a proton uh, can interact with an antineutrino via w, w boson again, and then your end product is a neutron and a positron. Then uh, here is a different uh, this is actually now when we flip this leg to the other side and a neutron, neutron interacts with a neutrino. So you can observe a um, proton and an electron. So neutrino, neutron scattering. So those are um, two reactions with neutrinos where you expect that you can see the products. Okay, 
So now that we know how you could potentially see a neutrino, then go back to how the search for the neutrino went. So um, uh, where do we get a lot of beta decays? Uh, nuclear fission, which basically means splitting atoms. So this is an example of a uranium atom, which is uh, very unstable, and then it is split into these two atoms. And as it is split, you can see that these uh, red and green are uh, neutrons and beta particles. Sorry. Sorry, neutrinos and beta particles. And so this happens in chain. So you can see that you, you can get a lot of neutrinos out of uh, nuclear fission. Where do you get nuclear fission? A bomb. So now we are in the middle of the century, well, not so, 1940s or so, um, when people were exploring, investigating how to their bomb. Um, but so they set up the task to find a neutrino, and they call it Project Poltergeist. Um, a good name for a particle that is like a ghost. So the recipe is you explode a bomb, and while the bomb is exploding, you let a detector fall next to the bomb, uh, and then the detector will detect the neutrinos, and then you wait until the radiation is gone. So you retrieve the detector, um, see the neutrino record, and then collect your Nobel Prize. Uh, I really like this diagram. You let it fall and it will land in a pillow of feathers and foam. So this is a good idea. And they actually did that experiment. And I think they detect, they did detect the neutrinos, but um, you can, as you can tell, it's a very fast burst of a lot of neutrinos. It's hard to reproduce. Um, and no one mentioned, but also seems pretty dangerous to just be exploding nuclear bombs. So another way that you can get uh, nuclear fission is in nuclear reactors. It's the same principle um, uh, where power plants use nuclear fission, which produces a lot of uh, these decay chains, and that produces a lot of heat, and then that. So. Uh, the project Poltergeist continued. This was now the 1950s, and they set up a detector close to a nuclear power plant in Savannah River. So here again, just to clarify, the nuclear fragments that remain are unstable and then undergo beta decays. So you get um, this reaction. And you place your neutrino detector close to this nuclear reactor. And via the inverse beta decay that we were looking at before, you should be able to see uh, the decay products, the neutron and the electron. So 1956, they uh, declared that they had detected neutrinos uh, from a cadmium detector. They saw 0.56 neutrinos per hour, so you know a few, a few neutrinos per day, which is pretty good for a particle that you expect almost never to interact. And this picture shows you um, how they, how the detection happened. So they had a very, uh, a large uh, tank of um, this uh, liquid scintillator, so you know, a substance where the antineutrino uh, interact with one of the cadmium uh, atoms, inverse beta decays happen. So the elect and sorry, the positron, which is an antiparticle, it uh, gets annihilated, so it emits two um, photons. And then the neutron uh, travels some time and as it is a neutral particle, you never really see this. But then the neutron gets captured by a different atom, and also some gamma rays are emitted. So basically, they were trying to look for a signal of two gamma rays 
or two photons in the opposite direction, and uh, sometime later, a secondary emission of gamma rays from the neutron. And that's how they found the neutrino. Yay, Nobel Prize. Many years later, as you can see. Uh, okay, now the story starts to get more interesting. So now that uh, the neutrino was discovered and detected, of course, everyone is excited and they want to try and see, study what else we learn about the neutrino. And so one of the other sources that I mentioned earlier is the sun. And the sun undergoes uh, this process called nuclear fusion, which is the opposite of fission, which means that uh, the atoms start to uh, merge. So uh, what keeps together the sun is gravity, but at the same time as gravity is pushing everything towards the center, uh, then the, that's where the helium atoms start to fuse, uh, sorry, hydrogen, and it produces helium. And along with this process, also uh, gamma rays and neutrinos are emitted. Um, so yeah, that balance between gravity trying to push everything in and then the nuclear fusion trying to push everything out And the thing is more complicated than that. This is, um, uh, I didn't put the name, but the scientist uh, with the last name Bacal uh, proposed this um, scheme of how the sun works. So you see there are multiple uh, processes of fusion that produce electron neutrinos. Like in here, two protons uh, emit juice here with an additional electron. And then there's this other chain of helium and a proton, beryllium, and uh, well, you can see there's many complex reactions and uh, but the neutrinos produce pretty much don't interact with anything inside the sun so they can reach the earth. Uh, so that way, studying the neutrinos is yeah, a way to understand the sun. Um, and here, this uh, graph is showing, showing you the energy of the neutrinos in each of these processes. So this uh, PP show is coming from here. These are the least energetic neutrinos. And then uh, there are a lot of them. And then higher energy neutrinos, you have fewer of them, and they just come from these different processes in this chain of fusion reactions. So uh, this is where the Homestake experiment took place. Um, this is basically a tank filled with cleaning fluid, basically. Uh, and if you get neutrinos from the sun, uh, this electron neutrino will interact with a uh, neutron from the uh, chlorine atom, and then you will get um, argon and some electrons emitted. So basically, uh, the idea was to every now and then just count how many argon atoms you have, because you in initiated with only uh, this chlorine, mostly chlorine substance. And this is just a picture of the tank and a person just for scale. So they expected some number of electron neutrinos from this calculation. But what this experiment actually saw is about a third of what they expected. So I mean several things. It could be that the model was wrong. It could be that the experiment had some error. They were not counting well. It could be that both of them were wrong, and there's a different explanation. Uh, but at this time, it was really just a mystery. And I will take a little detour here. Um, uh, in the 60s, uh, these three scientists, Schwartz, Leatherman, and Steinberg, 
uh, establish the existence of a different type of neutrino associated with the muon lepton. And uh, I will say that Leatherman was a very important person. Um, so uh, this is the detector that they used to detect, uh, to discover this neutrino spark chamber. And I think this is Schwartz. Um, so they discovered the muon neutrino and they also figured out how to make a beam of neutrinos. Uh, but we'll talk about that later. But uh, as you can see, discovering a different kind of neutrino was a pretty big deal. They also got a Nobel, Nobel Prize. And interestingly, this was earlier than the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the neutrino. Uh, okay. So at this point in time, uh, they had discovered a second generation, second family of particles, fermions in the standard model. Uh, so you know, it seemed like there was maybe some kind of pattern. Was there, were there many? Um, so uh, it was until much, much later that uh, the third family was discovered. Uh, the top quark was discovered until 1995 and was actually uh, here at Fermilab, one of the first detections. Uh, the bottom work quark was uh, way back, as well as the tau lepton. The most recent in this table is the tau neutrino. Uh, was also detected an experiment called Donut. Um, yeah, at, uh, eventually um, in the 20th century, uh, people had studied the properties of the C boson. So if you remember, W and C bosons are the ones that mediate the weak interaction. Uh, and this, uh, this table has this pretty nice square of like everything interacts via the weak force. Neutrinos are on this included from the other one. Um, but by studying the properties of the C boson, you can infer that there are actually only three families of neutrinos. Um, so, but let's go back to the story of neutrino experiments. Uh, so, another source of neutrinos are cosmic rays. So, there are um, particles that are emitted in space and they just arrive to the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so they, these are mostly protons and when they interact with uh, the molecules of the air, they uh, produce a shower of particles and these are mostly pions, uh, which are composed of quarks. And these pions are unstable, so they eventually decay and there are ele electromagnetic showers, a bunch of photons, um, but you also get a lot of neutrinos from these ions. As you can see, this reaction, the pion decays into a muon and a muon neutrino. And then the muon also, the muon eventually also decays into a positron, electron neutrino, and muon antineutrino. So you get a bunch of neutrinos the atmosphere and well sorry if you were to observe all of them you would expect to detect twice as many of the muon type as the electron type uh, one side note here is that in your experiment uh, sometimes it depending on the experiment you may or may not be able to distinguish between you know, an antineutrino, um, there's a way to distinguish them, but at most of the time you can't. So that's why there's this two to one ratio. Okay, so one of the experiments that studied atmospheric neutrinos is uh, this Kamiokande and Super Kamiokande experiments that uh, were in Japan. So uh, this this is a giant tank of water that is uh, underground. Well, it's under a mountain. Uh, and it is studying neutrinos. And it's 
neutrino almost doesn't interact with anything, you'd expect that uh, the neutrinos that you get from this side would be about the same number than you get from the other side. Um, so equal amount of neutrinos coming from all the different directions. Uh, yeah, so here's a picture of this uh, Super Cameo Candy experiment. It is very thousand, well, there's a thousand meters of rock on top of it, and you can see a little person here. So it's a pretty giant tank of water. And uh, eventually when a neutrino collides with a uh, nucleus of the water inside this detector, um, from the processes that uh, I described earlier, um, you can get electrons out of the electron neutrinos or muons from the muon neutrinos. Uh, so here is a picture showing you that this uh, muon neutrino interacted here produce a muon, and uh, this produces a bunch of light that then can be detected with these uh, we call these devices called photomultipliers. So. Essentially, this is like a light bulb, an old kind of light bulb, but in, instead of converting the electricity into light, it takes the electrons and converts them into an, a signal that then you can. So with this in mind, let me show you one picture of this detector from the inside. Looks, I think it looks pretty cool. Um, but okay, so this Cameo uh, Candy experiment, which is essentially the same as this, but a smaller version, um, uh, observed electron neutrinos and muon neutrinos. And as I mentioned earlier, they expected some flux. The number of events they saw neutrinos, electron neutrinos was okay. Um, so you can see that. Um, this is the energy of the neutrino, and then the line here is what they expected, and then these data points are what they observed. So you can see that most of these are uh, within the error bars. If you look at the muon neutrinos, that's not the same story. It looks pretty bad, actually. Um, so this is the total. Uh, flux of neutrinos that they expected from all directions, uh, but they actually saw like half of what they expected. So we're here at this point just left with more questions than answers. There are two experiments, uh, the solar and the atmospheric neutrino. There was, well, it was called the solar neutrino problem, the atmospheric neutrino problem. Uh, it, it was, well, the physics model at that point in time couldn't explain equations. And I must say that these are not the only two experiments. There were several experiments. And uh, I'll, before, before going to how these uh, answers, these mysteries were, were solved, um, I'm going to go back to our Feynman diagram. So as I mentioned earlier, um, the neutrinos uh, can interact via the weak interaction, which uh, is uh, mediated by the C and the W bosons. So uh, the neutrino that interacts with the W boson uh, is called a charge current interaction because uh, the W boson carries charge. So when this reaction happens, the neutrino is transformed into a charged lepton. And um, the C boson, on the other hand, is neutral. So there is no charge that is uh, transferred here. So the neutrino just bounces off, essentially. Nucleus, uh, and then you're left, again, with the same particles. They just bounce off each other. So. Uh, this works for both uh, all the three types of neutrinos, the electron, tau, and muon, uh, and the same as this one. Uh, and the experiments that I have talked about so far 
had only observed this kind of interaction because it's relatively easier to observe um, what happens with an electron, what happens with a proton, because these are charged particles. So they interact via electromagnetic force, and that involves light. We can see light, right? But neutral currents are not so easy to detect. Got a question from the chat from Kandar. Um, said, so when we detect neutrinos, in reality, we're detecting particles which could only be present if neutrinos interacted, right? We aren't able to directly detect neutrinos? That's the question. Yes, yes, that, that's exactly, that's exactly the, the idea. So the, the difference of how you detect uh, an electron, for instance, when it travels, it, uh, it is ionizing the medium. And what it means is that it is essentially like taking away electrons from other atoms and light is emitted. So you can see the light like exactly where an electron passed. But a neutrino, you don't really see it. You have to see when it interacts with something to observe the products of the neutrino. It's, um, okay. Interesting question should be mic. So for the Dune experiment then, since we're sending the neutrinos underground, if we're not able to uh, directly interact with the neutrinos, how are we able to kind of control where, in which direction we're sending the neutrinos underground to like, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll talk about that later, okay. yes. Great questions. I've seen a lot of questions that anticipate stuff Maria's going to say later, which just goes to show you're all on, on board. Thank I'm you. I'm glad you're, you're paying attention. Yeah. Any um, other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so both the home stake and the Super Kamiokande or Kamiokande had only observed charge current interaction. Uh, and if, if you notice, I only mentioned electron and muon neutrinos. He didn't detect the tau. Um, so this was in 1988, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, the tau neutrino later. Um, but, um, one advantage that you could have if you were to see neutral current interactions is that you wouldn't have to worry about the flavor of the neutrino. You're not gonna observe, you know, you're not gonna observe it anyway. So you can just count all of the kinds of neutrinos. So this is what the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory uh, was studying. This was another uh, solar neutrino experiment, and it's also pretty deep underground. Um, um, you're probably noticing a pattern here. All of these things are underground. And this was also a pretty large um, sphere. Uh, and it was also uh, coated with uh, these EMTs, photomultipliers. And the difference of this experiment is that it was using heavy water. What this means is that the water has an additional neutron. And as you saw before, to get neutrinos, they can interact with a neutron. Uh, and you can, if you are able to see what happens to the neutron, then you can count all of the neutrons. So um, uh, the, the theory of the time, told us that only electron neutrinos are produced at the sun. So if you were to measure all of them, about half and half, or like charge current and neutral current will happen at the same rate. In other words, ratio of the number to the text would be about one. But a surprise, not one, it was about a third. So what is happening here? Uh, 
this is where people were already proposing that a solution could be that the neutrinos were changing. So, uh, so these DC charge current interactions only accounted for the electron neutrinos. But these neutral current interactions were accounting for tau, muon, and electron neutrinos, which is why the ratio is about a third. Um, that explains that pretty well. Um, so two thirds of the electron neutrinos had already changed to a different kind of neutrino when they reached the Earth. And this actually is also a pretty good explanation to the uh, deficit that they saw in Super Camio Cande. So the neutrinos, the mu neutrinos that were generated in the atmosphere, but has like this amount of distance to travel before the, it reached the detector, had enough time to undergo an identity change or oscillation as we call it now. So now we can talk in detail more about the neutrino oscillations. Okay, so, so all these experiments uh, could be explained if neutrinos oscillate or change flavor as they travel to state, as they travel through space, sorry. So what the neutrino oscillation theory proposed is that uh, the neutrinos that we observe, the, the neutrinos that interact with matter are not the same as the neutrinos that are propagating through space. So is like saying they have a double identity. They have their flavor identity, which is the one that interacts with matter. And then they have their mass identity, which, um, which are not the same. Um, these, these two identities are related to each other by a mixing matrix, which is called a PMNS stands for Ponte Corvo, Maki, Nakawa, and Sakata, which were the four scientists that proposed this uh, mechanism of neutralization. Um, and so there are four numbers uh, that determine this <clears throat> mixing matrix. So it's three angles, three mixing angles, and a delta CP phase. So uh, another way you can picture it is that each, each of these uh, flavor sorry, mass state is, has a different amount of each flavor in them. And uh, this means that, you know, if, if the, if the three mass states were exactly the same as the flavor states, then we wouldn't see this oscillation change. And, oh, sorry, they can only oscillate if they have mass. And as I mentioned earlier, the standard model did not predict this. Um, there's a couple of more uh, details to really understand this, but essentially uh, the neutrinos interact differently and so they don't have a coupling to the Higgs boson, so they, they were, they're not allowed to have mass in this. So let's let's start with a simple example of how neutrino oscillations can be written. So if you had only two neutrino types, um, alpha and beta, your mixing matrix looks like this, and you can write each of the states as a combination. Alpha is a combination of uh, neutrino one and neutrino two, and the neutrino beta is a combination, a different combination of the of neutrino. Now you you can write these as quantum mechanical states and plug them into the Schrodinger, Schrodinger equation, which uh, will tell you the probability of observing uh, either A or B, alpha or beta. Um, so you solve this equation and you get a lot of complicated math, uh, but eventually you end up with a uh, a probability that is not as complicated. Um, this is the same as this, but it's written in a different form. Uh, so this uh, propagation in space uh, involves 
uh, entering the mass of the neutrino, sorry, the energy and the, the time it propagates. So you can see that in this case of two neutrino, two neutrino oscillation, the probability that it changes into a different one depends not only of the mixing angle, but also the difference in mass. That's very important is the difference in mass, not and the length that tra the neutrino traveled as well as its energy. And the same idea is uh, used to derive, um, yeah, so in this example, continuing with the two flavors, uh, you can uh, put this probability into a graph. So in this example, uh, your, this x-axis is the length, uh, where you will observe, you know, and this is the probability. So if your alpha is um, electron and your beta is muon, this would correspond to the red curve. Um, if you started with all electron neutrinos, uh, by the point that you are at 400 kilometers, uh, more than half of your neutrinos will neutrinos. This happens like cyclical matter manner uh, over time. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. For those on Zoom, uh, the red line here with represents your initial state of electron neutrinos, and as you travel, uh, you have particular uh, distances where your maximum, you have the maximum probability of finding the neutrino at a different flavor. And uh, again, this is the same graph, uh, but we usually look at it in units of baseline, which is uh, the length over the energy, is what you have in this expression. Okay. So, for the three flavor case, um, if you do the same, uh, the same math, uh, you end up with a much more complicated expression, uh, but it still depends on three mixing angles, this additional delta CP phase, and the difference between uh, the mass of the three and two, and the two and one, and three and one, and L over E again. So, uh, as you can see, this uh, shape is a little bit more complicated. Um, any here, this is this plot is made uh, assuming that you start with a muon neutrino, uh, and so you can see that uh, until you get uh, to about sixteen thousand L over E is when you start to see the most neutrinos. Uh, and if we zoom in into this little uh, slice up to 4,000 L over E, you can see that here the probability that you change your muon neutrino changes into electron neutrino is very small. And the red line here um, corresponds to the tau neutrino, and you can see that most of the time these muon neutrinos will just go back and forth between tau and electron, sorry, between tau and muon, only a handful of electron neutrinos. So this actually explained very well the two experiments that had the solar problem and the atmospheric neutrino problem. Uh, and this Nobel Prize was awarded in 2015 to Kajita, or Kajita, I don't know how to pronounce, and uh, McDonald's, uh, which were working on each of these Super Kamiokande and the Sudbury uh, Neutrino Observatory. So, so now that neutrino oscillations were discovered, um, what is, what else do we want to know? Where uh, we always want to, this is we always want to have measurements as precise as possible. And um, we have 
constant sources of neutrinos from the sun and from cosmic rays, uh, but we have no control of the energy they have, how much they traveled, and so on. So we can make our own neutrino beams. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there was a Nobel Prize awarded because someone came up with the idea of how to make a neutrino beam. So uh, let's start with a recipe for making neutrinos. Um, your main ingredient is a bunch of protons. So essentially, if you have a tank of helium or hydrogen, uh, that's your main ingredient. The rest is just physics. So you, you accelerate this into a target, uh, which has more, uh, more atoms, sorry, more, more uh, protons and neutrons, such as this graphite. Once this uh, collision happens, a bunch of uh, hadrons are emitted. So you usually get mostly a lot of pions, both positive and negative. And uh, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the pions eventually decay into uh, muon and neutrinos and antineutrinos. So you get a set of magnets which uh, deflect, depending on the orientation of the magnet, in this case, they are deflecting the uh, negative pions away, so you are only left with the positive pions. Uh, and then these pions eventually decay into a lot of muons uh, and positive muons and muon neutrinos. And in this picture, you have this thin wall that is called the beam dump, because you have if you want a beam of pure neutrinos, uh, your muons will probably interfere with your measurements. So you put this wall to stop the muons. And uh, eventually you get a bunch of neutrinos that are traveling through Earth uh, towards, directed towards some detector. And as I mentioned before, you just flip, you just flip the direction of the, your magnetic field to select the opposite charge, and you get a beam of antineutrinos. Now, um, just to answer the question that we had earlier, you can make a beam of neutrinos, um, but since we don't have the equivalent of a magnet that works with the weak force, uh, we cannot really direct them to a specific, towards a specific uh, direction. Like, you cannot have a laser made of neutrinos. But you, you can have this very intense source, which means a lot of neutrinos are coming out of it. Um, but it just going uh, like a lamp, it just opens in towards all directions, I think. But if you make enough of them, it's still a pretty useful source of neutrinos. So now this, let's talk about the neutrinos at Fermilab. So we have um, here, here in the Ramsey Auditorium, uh, Fermilab has uh, two beams of neutrinos. Um, you, there is the LINAC here is the linear accelerator where we start with the uh, protons. These are accelerated uh, here, and then they are sent for the booster, which is one of the neutrino beams. Um, sorry, they are they are accelerated here. They go to the main injector where they actually gain a lot of the momentum, and then they are collided to. They are sent to one or the other uh, beam. This is the boon beam, and this is the Numi beam. And then in the future, we're going to build an even more intense beam for the long baseline neutrino facility. Um, uh, yeah, this is kind of an old picture, but essentially it's still working in the same way. So um, this is a set of experiments that are here or were here. This is the Minerva experiment, which has been, um, has already been decommissioned, 
but currently the Icarus and SVND experiments are uh, already, this is taking data and this is very close to take data. Microbun also stopped taking data, but it's still here. And this is the NOV experiment, which I, I work on and I will tell you more about it. So uh, we have our BMAP Fermilab and NOVA is called a long baseline neutrino experiment because uh, the neutrinos that are made here travel this very long distance to be detected at the far detector. So um, the, the beam at Fermilab produces either mostly muon neutrinos or muon antineutrinos. And at the far detector, we expect to observe uh, the muon neutrinos oscillated either into muon, sorry, either into electron neutrinos. So uh, just to give you an idea of uh, the size of these detectors, this is a building that you walked into this morning, and this is the near the near detector that is here, formula, uh, but it is buried 100 meters underground. And then the fire detector, which is much, much larger. It's, it's pretty impressive to see. Uh, and I also have to remind you that these are huge experiments that are not only made of plastic and neutrinos and beams. There are also lots of people who work on these experiments to get the science out of it. So the latest results of NOVA. So uh, the theory of neutrino oscillations with the PMNS matrix uh, explains uh, the neutrinos we observe. In NOVA, we, are, we can predict the number of events that we observe um, depending on the value of the different mixing parameters. And by observing the energy of the muon neutrinos and antineutrinos energy, and also the energy of the electron, neutrinos and antineutrinos, uh, can make some calculation and extract the value of these parameters. So this is um, the value uh, that we got in one of the most recent pub publications. Um, and notice here that uh, this is data that was taken from 2014 to 2020. And you know, in these many years, you can only see 200 neutrinos, 100 antineutrinos, and even less of the electron kind. So just to give you an idea of, you, you have a neutrino, we have a neutrino beam at Fermilab that emits um, millions of neutrinos, but we are only able to see a handful of them. It also has to do with the fact that we are 100, 800 kilometers away. That's, that's the status of this long experiment. So there is a lot of uh, experiment that have measured the oscillation parameters. Um, some of them also through the sun, atmospheric uh, neutrinos or accelerator neutrinos. And uh, at this point, pretty much we have good measurements of most of these parameters, as you can see there. Um, but there, this, the value of um, this delta M square and delta CP is not, is not very well measured. So um, besides not measuring that, what else we don't know? There are a lot of things, uh, a lot of questions left, such as like, what is, what is the actual mass of the neutrino? Um, it could be that there are more types of neutrinos that they just interact um, at, in a different way that is not the weak interaction. Uh, we don't know if there is a different way that the neutrinos interact with the Higgs. Uh, we don't know which one is the heaviest or the lightest uh, and why they are so small or if they are their own antiparticles or if neutrinos and antineutrinos oscillate differently. I'm just gonna focus on this question because uh, the experiments that are upcoming, such as Dune, could help answer this question. So I didn't talk about much about this delta CP uh, phase, um, but this measures 
how much do the processes that we observe uh, violate CP symmetry. This essentially means charge, this means charge parity symmetry. And if there is CP violation, it means that particles, the neutrinos and antineutrinos we observe will oscillate differently. So that is why we are working towards having even more precise uh, neutrino oscillation measurements. Yeah, if we get a good measurement of this, um, it would be a pretty exciting discovery. So in order to get more precise measurements, we are building a new experiment that's even even bigger than NOVA. It's, uh, it will come with a new beam that has, would be, would produce many, many more neutrinos and even more people would be working on this experiment. So just to give you an idea, these are, um, uh, there would be a set of near detectors close to Fermilab and then a set of uh, underground detectors in the, in the far site, which is at a longer baseline of 1300 kilometers. And to give you a better idea of how big these detectors are, this is the facility that is um, uh, more than a kilometer underground and there are planned to be four modules, but two of them are already under construction. Just to give you a better idea, this is the size of a person, the size of a plane, the size of the detector. Um, and uh, this will allow us to measure with much more precision uh, the neutrino oscillation parameters. But that's not the end of the story. There is even many more things that you could measure with neutrinos. So one of the very cool things that has been observed with neutrinos is a supernova. So in 1987, uh, this is the only supernova that we have actually recorded with telescopes. Uh, uh, a few experiments were able to detect neutrinos and they saw in total 30 neutrinos, which sounds like a little, but if you're constantly measuring only a handful of neutrinos over time, there is this burst of neutrinos that is associated with a supernova. That, that's a pretty uh, uh, important measurement. And another thing that I wanted to share is that this image at the top is an older image of the supernova. And this image at the bottom is a newer image. I don't know if you've heard about the James Webb telescope. But this is this is a picture, and you can see how like the technology changes from. Um, I'm not sure if it, this picture is from the early 2000s, but this picture is much newer. And similarly, as we could we can improve our telescopes, the newer neutrino detectors. If we were to observe a supernova nowadays, we would be able to detect many more neutrinos, and this would uh, allow us to better understand uh, supernovas and other uh, phenomena that occurs in space. So other phenomena that occur in space, we have the field uh, that is called multi-messenger astronomy. So um, there are events in space that produce, uh, multiple events that produce uh, different particles or effects that we can detect. So for instance, this is uh, the pair of neutron stars, they emit gravitational waves, and this has been detected, these have been detected. They emit uh, cosmic rays, gamma rays, light, which we can observe with uh, regular telescopes, as well as neutrinos. So as we can see the neutrinos, we have seen gravitational waves. Uh, in the last couple, in the last few years, this experiment called Ice Cube has seen very high neutrino energy events that were later associated with gamma rays, so with uh, light. Um, and this, this came, it was consistent that they came from the same source. And also uh, last year, the same experiment announced uh, evidence of a very 
intense emission of, sorry, a very energetic neutrino that was emitted from uh, the galactic nucleus of this Messier 77. Is there a question? We have a question from the chat. Um, so why do cosmic rays travel in a curved path like you see in the image? Um, why is that? A great question. So uh, cosmic rays, as I mentioned earlier, I, are made of uh, lots of different particles, including protons, pions, uh, electrons. So all the stuff that interacts with electromagnetic uh, interaction. So uh, in this particular case, in theory, it is magnetic deflection. So you could you could get a bunch of particles that are emitted from uh, neutron stars, supernova, or whatever effect, uh, whatever phenomena is happening there. And as they travel to space, they would encounter probably other stars, uh, other um, objects. Uh, and if they are emitting light, if they have uh, a lot of mass and they have a strong uh, gravitational pull, uh, then all of the particles that you'll see here will interact with that and move around, which is why we see this curved, uh, curved path. Um, but neutrinos, which only interact, yeah, the weak force, will not interfere with anything in their way, pretty much. Um, so if there's a star in the middle of this path, they probably just go right through it. If there's, um, I don't know, a very big galaxy or some, some, something else that, has, that is emitting electrons or something, the neutrinos will not care, and they'll just go into a straight line. So um, that's precisely one of the reasons why neutrino astronomy is uh, very exciting. So you pretty much get a signal directly from the source without any interference from other cosmic bodies that could be in the middle of the way. Uh, and I wanted to show you uh, this experiment, Ice Cube. I think it's a very cool experiment. So it is located on the South Pole, and this is uh, ice. That's why it's called Ice Cube. So it is uh, about a kilometer under this ice, and it's made of an array of these uh, domes, digital optical modules, which essentially is the same, similar to a photomultiplier. So if a neutrino interacts here, it produces light, and each of these uh, domes captures the light, and you can make an image of that neutrino interaction. And since this is uh, such a big array of detectors. Uh, that's why this uh, experiment was able to see this very energetic neutrino from this from the Messier 77 uh, galactic nucleus. Uh, so not only that, as I mentioned before, neutrinos pretty much don't interact with anything, so they could also be a window into the Big Bang. So. This uh, cartoon of the Big, Big Bang is showing you uh, what happened, what particles started appearing at which time scale. So only a couple of seconds after the Big Bang, uh, neutrinos were already generated. Um, and later on, uh, we have the cosmic microwave background. So this is uh, radiation in the microwave wavelength, which has been observed coming from all directions. Um, but there is also a bunch of neutrinos that are everywhere that came from this primary, primordial interaction. But these are so, so low energy that it's difficult, very difficult to detect them. But uh, as the technology of our detectors improves, uh, I think we'll eventually see them, and that would be a very exciting thing to see. Uh, we could get information of what happened second a second after the Big Bang. Um, so, yeah, I want to summarize here, because uh, we've gone through a lot. 
neutrinos are one of the least under understood particles. I think in this presentation I gave you more questions um, and answers, but I hope that this makes you more interested in neutrinos. And um, the fact that neutrinos oscillate and have mass is the only evidence, the first evidence that we have of physics that are not explained by the standard model as we know it. Uh, and that is why they're pretty exciting. And there's a lot of scientists and experiments that are uh, running to better understand all of the characteristics of the neutrinos. And of course, Fermilab is one of the places that is uh, doing a lot of work of, uh, in this area. And, and yeah, thank you for listening. I, I would like to answer as many questions. Thank you so much, Maria. Let's give her another round of applause. Thank you. That was such a great talk. Uh, Maria is actually, um, this is her first year lecturing for us her Saturday morning physics, her first session. So um, I thought that was amazing. Uh, great, so uh, we're doing really well on time. Let's see if there's any further questions. I saw quite a bit going on in the chat. We tried to field as many as we could along the way. And I'm sure that in person, some of you may have some questions as well. All right, looks like we have a couple. And make sure you get uh, mic'd up before. So here, and then, oh, so she was first, um, and then her. Okay, so do neutrinos interact with like the cur curvature of space time itself, or do they, do they like not interact? With it? Um, so uh, let me show you. Oh, this is so far in the beginning. Will I get into that image? So. We so far don't have evidence of what neutrinos do when they travel through like very uh, strong gravitational fields. Um, like you can see this image that there is something here that is very massive and therefore like your galaxies and everything are start to get curved. Well, it's the light itself that gets curved. Um, so we don't really know. I don't think so far there's an experiment that's trying to measure that. Just the space itself, and I suppose the neutrinos will just follow the curve. It's not really my field of expertise, so I don't want I don't want to lie to you. I don't know. Right. Another question. I'm just going to look really quick on the chat. Zoom, feel free to ask questions or repeat questions if they were answered during the lecture. Oh yeah, we've got one in the front. For the different flavors of neutrinos, is there anything how how are they different? Oh, okay. Um so essentially the differences that we know is that they have, um, besides the difference in mass, I need to get into the diagram. <laughs> yeah, so really the diagram for uh, tau, muon, or electron neutrino, anti neutrino is the same. Um, but the reason that we don't see as many tau neutrinos, for instance, it's just that the neutrino needs to have more energy in order to have uh, to be able to produce the tau because it is heavier than the muon or the electron, for instance. Um, so that's that's the only difference. And the I guess the quantum numbers there is uh, the lepton number is conserved. So that means if you had a 
tau neutrino, you can only produce a tau lepton. A muon neutrino, only a muon, and so on. Um, so yeah, essentially, it's just that the mass of the lepton. Any more questions? I saw one on Zoom. I'm not sure if it was asked because I just stepped out of the room for a moment. Does gravitational lensing affect neutrinos? Um, as far as I know, we don't have evidence of that. Um, so the way we know about gravitational lenses is that we observe that the light uh, looks a bit of curving space. Um, so far, we don't have a similar image for neutrinos. So. And there is a question on uh, Zoom very far in the beginning. Um, uh, Syed was wondering uh, why we think neutrinos are similar to dark matter. OK. Um, so I think one of the reasons is that there are a lot of neutrinos just traveling through space. And since we know they have mass, they could be contributing to that uh, dark matter that we know is there, but we don't know exactly what it is. Um, the problem is that uh, the neutrinos, for neutrinos to be dark matter, you would need to have a different type of interaction that is not this W or C boson. It will have to be some other type of interaction. And so far, I don't think that we have observed that. But that could be an explanation of what what is the dark matter that is there. How different do neutrinos and antineutrinos like act and interact? Uh, so that, that is one of the questions that we are trying to answer. So the uh, the way that we would know this is by comparing, well, actually, like experiments like NOVA, we measure both the beam of neutrinos and the beam of antineutrinos. And uh, if we observe a lot more neutrinos or a lot less neutrinos than, uh, than if delta CP, so that parameter would tell you if delta CP is zero, that means that pretty much they behave the same way, just with like opposite everything. Um, but there is, uh, if you are able to measure that number and you know that it's not zero, it will tell you like how different they are. But in essence, uh, as far as we know, they both interact in this similar way. Further questions for our speaker? And also always ask about non-neutrino uh, related things. For instance, Maria, I'm curious about um, how you got from Mexico to uh, looks like Iowa State. Uh, yeah, so uh, we had a, um, uh, in Mexico a opening for an internship. And I applied to do that, and that internship was for uh, Fermilab. So I was very fortunate to have that opportunity. And then when I was here at Fermilab, I met uh, my professor from Iowa State who had uh, a PhD. That's so awesome. Go ahead. 
can you explain how Feynman diagrams work? Because they've been in like every lecture we've had and no one's explained to us how they work. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, yeah, I'll do my best. Let's make sure that we um, point with the um, oh, yeah. thing for the speakers. I'm sorry for the full consume. So, um, very quick intro to Feynman diagrams is that uh, each arrow here um, corresponds to a, a fermion. So, for instance, quarks and leptons. And then the arrows have to be continuous, as in this is a vertex, and your arrow goes in, it has to go out in the same direction. Um, and this vertex, for instance, has a W button with, with a positive charge. And then a U quark is coming, coming in, down quark is coming out. So this, um, the charge of the U quark, I believe is Um, but uh, the, the charge of this quark is given transfers through, the, through this interaction. Uh, and so you have to know to make sure that the total charge on this side of the diagram is the same as the total charge on this side of the diagram. So um, proton has a positive charge, so there your positron have that charge. Uh, or you could look at it the other way, that if you look at it in reverse time, then your positron is interacting via the W boson, which passes that charge to this side. Um, that's, I think, one of the easier ways to interpret the diagrams. Um, and what do the directions mean? Um, and what are the axes in a Feynman diagram? Yeah, so you're... You can draw it either horizontal or vertical, but in this uh, convention, I am taking the time to be the horizontal axis. So that's why um, the antineutrino is going backwards. Um, and if you, if you have this um, kind of definition of what is the direction of time, that's why if you flip the if you flip the arrows, you can essentially just do any kinds of flips because the direction of the arrows is already set. So uh, that's why you can do this kind of flipping, moving the legs, and uh, you can even construct diagrams facing other diagrams here. So uh, I don't know if you had this, like if you have this beta decay diagram, you could face this diagram here. And essentially, it is um, uh, depicting the quantities that are conserved. That's like your basic. And I think that's the basic. Did, did that make sense? They are pretty tricky. Um, it's, it's, I mean, it's kind of, as you said, it's a bookkeeping method, right? It's a way of kind of keeping track of all the things that need to be conserved and making sure you're accounting for it all. But it also has like some really weird implications, like that backwards in time thing that we kind of glossed over, kind of crazy. Yeah. It's one way of thinking about how we're, the interactions that are happening, but it's a really weird one. Yeah, well, in reality, this is written in equations, and from the equations you can derive that you can just put it in diagrams. Um, yeah, it's, it's a pretty complicated math. Uh, I think maybe time for like one more question, and then um, we've got to get you guys to our uh, in-person tours. So anything on Zoom? Last chance there. Anything in person? No more questions. In that case, then, I think let's have one more um, round of applause to our speaker and also our volunteers.
Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to stick around a little bit, but we'll start getting you wrapped up. Those of you in person, let's get you to the, the lobby so you can start loading up for today's tour. Um, and uh, I think Maria and I will still be here if you have any quick questions on the way, but we'll start getting you up there. Those of you on Zoom, I do not believe, I think Becky or somebody verified that we do not have a virtual tour today, but I do recommend that if you're just too excited, um, maybe check out our uh, Fermilab's YouTube channel and look up some more things about neutrinos. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you next time.